everybody. Welcome back to our show. I am very delighted to have Paul Graziano with us. Some call him Paul Revere. Why is he called Paul Revere? It's because he's been putting community boards and local civic organizations on high alert. His message is, the developers are coming. The developers are coming to tear down your homes and replace them with apartment houses. What is this alert about? It's a plan by our dear Mayor Adams to tear down small outer borough communities in order to allow the largest New York City developers to build high rises in their place in the outer boroughs. In the name of bright sounding words, force the vibrant neighborhoods. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Relocate small businesses so they can be near their customers. Create a gentle density and missing middle housing. Oh yes, build housing that is more affordable. Watch out, when you hear that word affordable, watch out. They are calling this zoning package the city of yes. People listen to the bright sounding words. They don't think, what does it mean? They are blinded by its brightness. They only hear hope. They do not research into what has already happened when those bright sounding words have been put into effect. Today, Paul Graziano is going to help us find out what those bright sounding words actually mean. Right? That's the reason they're there. Well, part of the commercial on that 15,000 square feet, the residential portion is called campus infill. And campus infill would allow any of these areas to fill in those green spaces. Wow. So this is what this area looks like. Classic garden apartments, three stories tall, lots of green space. This is the whole complex. The yellow boxes are the areas with a significant space. Currently, it's in an R4 zone. Again, a significant portion of your neighborhood is zoned R4. It has a 33-foot height limit, 0.9 FAR, floor area ratio. So it's almost maxed out on their floor area today. So when you're looking at this yellow square, that's the main portion of this. Currently, they want to make the baseline taller. The district fixes that I was talking about before, okay? It brings it to a 45 foot height limit instead of 33 feet. So all of a sudden it's immediately a, foot to, uh, a story taller. Also the FAR goes up from a 0.9 to a 1.0. Now if you're in a transit zone, you go up to a 1.5 in floor area. So now you can bulk that building up. If you're in the campus infill, you can raise that up another story. So now we're at a 55 foot tall building with a 1.5 FAR and now I want to put commercial on the first floor. There's your 15,000 square feet of commercial. And as I say here, this proposal will take the garden out of garden apartments, yeah. right? But it also is going to affect all religious properties in the city of New York, whether or not you're in a transit zone or not, they will be able to build at this level. In all low density neighborhoods, they will be able to build at high density on all religious properties. Parking lots, they can demolish a school and build a new thing, whatever it might be. Only religious organizations, nobody else. Okay? So, let me switch over to your community. Okay, I already showed you this. This is the zoning that you were before before 2005. You were R32, R4, and R5 with a few small areas that were contextual, R3A and R41. And this is what happened after. You had R3X, which is a detached two-family zone that we're sitting in today, R4A, which is a detached two-family zone, and R4-1. And it really helped to protect this community. This is what the city is showing everybody. It's a little bit more housing in every neighborhood. 
You've probably heard the mayor say this a number of times, a little bit more housing in every neighborhood. So his statement is, we want to build 100,000 units across the city of New York, 100,000 units in 15 years. That's what this proposal is going to do. Now, let me break that down to you. 100,000 units divided by 59 community boards is 1,700 units per community board. Divided by 15 years is 120 units a year. We don't need to change the zoning to, to build 120 units per community board per year. We're doing that already. Okay, so again, that's in their environmental impact statement, which is the document that they use to justify what they're doing. So either their environmental impact statement is grossly underestimating what this is going to do, and there's a reason for that, and I'm gonna show you why, or there's no reason for this program to proceed because we're already doing this, okay? So again, these are their slides. See all the blue? That's us. We are the target. Allow for missing middle housing. That would be three to six story apartment buildings in town center zoning and transit oriented apartment buildings. That's just what I told you. In the blue areas. Help homeowners by providing additional flexibility and allowing accessory dwelling units. And they only have one thing for high density. That's create a universal affordability preference, UAP. All that does is give developers a 20% bonus to build more housing. It has to be quote unquote affordable, but the point is developers aren't building affordable housing unless they're forced to do it. There's, they're not forcing them to build affordable. It's, a, it's, it's to say if you build another 20%, affordable, then we'll give you another 20% bonus. Nobody except for affordable housing developers, which are a very small subset of the developers in, in the city of New York, are going to do this. So as you can see, the vast majority is focused on our lower density areas. Lift costly parking mandates for new housing, enable conversions, small and shared apartments, uh, the other term for that is SROs. They are bringing SROs back to the city, single room occupancy, uh, because we're going straight back to the 19th century. The 20th century was a bad idea, apparently. And this actually goes back to what the city planning is saying. We're, we have outdated zoning. We have to get rid of our outdated zoning. H how many people do we have in the city of New York today? Let, hold on, don't say anything crazy. Permanent population. 8.2 million. Anybody know what the population of the city was in 1960? 8 million. So in 63 years or 64 years, we have gone from 8 million to 7 million to 8 million to 8.8 million to 8.2 million. So we're at the same number that we were 60, 64 years ago. And yet, again, permanent housing crisis even though we lost all of this population and gained all of this population. Now, the zoning that was put in place in 1961 can accommodate, the zoning we have today, if we never change the zoning again, that includes the Metro North. If we if Metro North disappeared and we never change the zoning again, we can accommodate, zoning-wise, 16 to 20 million people. Double to more than 150% of our current population, 16 to 20 million. The 1916 zoning that they want to bring us back to, because that's really what they're trying to do, is they're trying to get rid of everything that happened in 1961 and bring it back to, do you know what that capacity is? 55 million. This is in their own documents, 55 million. And that tracks with all of the analysis that I have done showing 300 to 500% increases everywhere in population and in density, in lower density communities in particular. So these are your very pretty slides that they show how beautiful it's gonna be when that garage gets converted into a unit. 
Um, first they say it's for seniors who want to age in place. Then they say it's for a graduate from college. Oh, and yeah, and if you need a little extra income, that's, that's the after statement. And again, it's if you live in a single family home and you now have three units, that's a 200% increase of the density on that property. This is the reality of it. They call it gentle density. It's not gentle at all. Okay. This is the thing I was saying before. Help homeowners adjust FAR, perimeter heights, yards, and other rules to provide flexibility for homeowners. Many older homes are out of compliance, blocking homeowners from adapting their homes to meet their families' needs. <coughs> now, I'm going to tell you something. When they did the rezoning for Pelham Gardens, they only rezoned it to what the majority of the buildings were, because that's the way it works. You go in and you say, oh, 75, 80, 85 percent of this can be in this zoning category. So for example, you've got 20 two-family homes on a block of 30 homes. Two-thirds of the block are two-family. And someone petitions and says, I want to make that block a one-family zone. You can't do it because two-thirds are two-family. So all of the zonings that were done had very high compliance rates. They are cherry picking and saying, oh yeah, out of those thousand houses, a hundred of them don't comply. Yeah, but 900 of them do. So that's the way that they are focusing on this. Okay, wow. That's what they're telling you. But the real reason, again, is to create more development, subdivisions, more units. Okay, town center zoning. This will be put on every commercial overlay in the city of New York in R1 through R5 zones. Your commercial overlays are your little commercial districts in the middle of your residential districts. So uh, Eastchester Road, right? By, uh, what is it, Mace? Right. right. So they want to build two to four stories of residential above commercial. Mm -hmm. And allow that as of right on all commercial overlays. Transit-oriented development. You see these purple areas? These are the areas where you'd be allowed to build apartment buildings on the wide streets or on the corners on the narrow streets. Okay? And that's where I was talking about with the religious properties having high density housing on their parking lots or on their excess property. And there's your end parking mandates where they show a dirty garage on the right and a beautiful sunlit apartment, which doesn't make sense when you have a garage in the sub-basement. But, but hey, it's a drawing, so it's a fantasy. It's okay. Notice, parking will still be allowed, well, thank you very much, Department of City Planning, um, and projects can add what is appropriate at their location. Now, I've spoken to several developers since this came out. 201, they said, oh, well, if we don't have to build parking, we're just going to have amenities in the basement so we can charge higher rents for our apartment building. Okay, so there we go, end parking mandates. Now, I'm gonna show you an example in your own community of what would happen in an R4A zone. This is on uh, uh, Waring. Waring, that's right, sorry. So, so this is a property, it's about 6,100 square feet. Here's a, a better view of it. Okay, so it's in the transit zone. So let's say, remember, you only need 5,000 square feet. Now you can build an apartment building. So you can build something like that. Okay, um, again, I'm not an architect, but this is the basic bulk. It would be a four story building. It would have, uh, let me think, 6,100 times 1.5. So it'd be about 9,000 square feet. So it'd be about 18 units or so, 18, 15 to 18 units of housing. Okay. Now, let's say that developer bought that property along with the other three houses, so they have the whole block from. Now you're talking about a property that's about 13,000 square feet, and you're going to end up with something like that. 
But again, as of right. As of right. Not a zoning change. As of right. Here's the town center zoning. So again, this is Mason East Chester. Okay? So let's say that one developer says, you know what? I'm going to build either a brand new building with commercial on the first floor or I'm going to build three floors above. Oops, I'm sorry. Three floors above. And then the other guys on the other corners get the same idea. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. No parking required. Mm -hmm. okay. Now here's the campus development for religious facilities. This is Holy Rosary, I believe. Rosary. Yeah, okay. So notice that gaping unused space. Well, that's going to be a nice building there. Nice, big, chunky building. Mm -hmm. So, remember I was talking about the environmental review? They're not actually analyzing anything. They have stated, quote, because this is a citywide rezoning, we can't possibly analyze it, so we're going to create models. So they're creating 15 theoretical representative neighborhood models and several prototypical site models, theoretical models to determine our future. Okay? And they're expecting the outcome based on their algorithm that there would be a little less than one unit per acre over 15 years across the city, which makes no sense at all. And again, the range will be between 58,200 and 108,900. Now, why are they saying this? Because clearly, from what I'm showing you, that is not what's going to happen, mm -hmm. right? So why are they saying this? Because when you file an environmental impact statement, you have to prove that what you're doing isn't going to set off alarms. It's not going to, there's a series of check marks that you have to check to say what we're doing will have no effect. It's not going to have any effect. So if they lowball the numbers, then the EIS is going to say it's not going to have any effect. Well, look at the areas where this is not going to have any effect. Land use zoning and public policy, socioeconomic conditions, water and sewer infrastructure, solid waste and sanitation, energy, greenhouse gases and climate change, air quality, public health, and neighborhood character. That's right, this will have no effect on any of those things in the city of New York. That's why they came up with a number that makes no sense. I've done studies on Jamaica Estates, Douglaston and Little Neck, Kew Gardens, Laurelton, Ridgewood, and I've looked at areas in the Bronx and Brooklyn and Staten Island. <coughs> Everywhere I look, it's a 300 to 500% increase in, in density. Everywhere. So it's just lies. That's all I can say. It is lies. And it's incredibly damaging. This will destroy our communities. There's, there's no going back if this gets passed. So with that, I do want to just show you a couple of, a few more things, and then I'm going to take questions and comments. I'm going to just talk about single family zoning for a second. Now, you have a small area in Throbsneck, Country Club. It's about 12 blocks of single family zoning. You also have Riverdale, which has a fairly substantial amount of single family zoning. You also have a block on the north side of Pelham Bay Park, which is actually in the Bronx, even though people think it's in the, town, the village of Pelham, mm -hmm. or Pelham Matter, excuse me. And then you have Charlotte Gardens, which was the urban renewal development that Jimmy Carter did in the South Bronx. Those are your single family areas in the Bronx. Okay. If we have 15% of the city of New York as single family, 15%, look at the other cities in the United States. Seattle is 81% single family. Chicago, 79% single family. Portland, 77% single family. Los Angeles, 75% single family. Minneapolis, 70% single family. Washington, D.C., 36% single family. And we have 15%. And where is the vast majority of that? East of the Van Wyck Expressway, where I live. 25% of Queens is zoned single family. 25% of Staten Island is zoned single family. 5% of the Bronx, 
3% of Brooklyn, 15% across the city with another 9% two family. That is our exclusionary zoning, less than a quarter of the city. You cannot have an area that's called exclusionary if it's only a quarter of the city. If it were 80% of the city, you might have an argument. But to have it be a tiny portion of the city, it makes no sense. Look what happens if we pull Eastern Queens out. There's hardly any single family zoning in the city. Okay, this is Eastern Queens. Everything in yellow is single family. It's about 50%. Another 25% is two family. So single and two family together is about 75% of Eastern Queens. It will all become de facto three families per property. Three families per property minimum. Okay, and if you're in a transit zone, that's the cross-hatched areas, in the one and two family zones, and the blue areas, that's the low density apartment zones, you'll be able to build an apartment building. Okay, and the last thing I'm gonna show you is this. These are the low density areas of the city. There's your town center zoning. Look at the areas in blue. These are the areas with high owner occupancy. One and two family homes, co-ops, and condos. Mostly in Queens, Staten Island, Southern Brooklyn, and the North and East Bronx. Which also, not coincidentally, are the lowest density parts of the city. The lower density parts of the city have the highest percentage of owner-occupied properties. We also happen to pay 300 to 400% property tax rates than the richest parts of the city. Our property tax rates, you'll see in blue, right? The blue areas. This is, this is from the controller. I'm not making this up. This is from Brad Lander, who I don't have a great amount of respect for in general, but he did have a very nice set of maps here that really show what's going on. This is Greenpoint and Williamsburg. This is most of Manhattan. And look at the Bronx, Queens, Southern Brooklyn, and Staten Island. We are actually the largest portion of property taxes in the city of New York. And they are telling us we don't deserve to exist. So with that, questions, comments? Well, actually, wait, I do have one last slide to show you. Sorry. I wanted to just show you this. There are four outcomes to this situation. Sorry, this is my summary. Outcome number one, there are 51 people on the city council. We need 26 votes to stop this. So let's say we get 26 votes, we end it, we stop it. Unfortunately, number two, the people who want this get 26 plus votes. Well, then we have to accept our fate. We could try to sue, that's a possibility. I didn't put that in there, but the chance of winning uh, an environmental lawsuit, because it would be on the environmental, it's about 10%. So it's possible, but it doesn't always work. Number three is that the other side wins and we pick up and move. And number four is that the bill that has been introduced in the assembly, Assembly Bill 9417 and the companion Senate bill gets passed that would allow our communities the option to opt out of the city. And this is not Staten Island, you know, the county of Staten Island seceding. This is a new town of Pelham Gardens seceding or a new town of Throgsnick seceding. This is a statewide bill. It's aimed at a statewide audience. But the main focus is to give our communities, which are primarily homeowner communities, just like most villages and towns in the state of New York, the ability to have self-determination if the city tries to force this on us. And that bill is in the assembly right now. And I've actually done my homework. These are some of the areas where it would be easy to become your own town, and, and your area is part of that. Numbers three and four, Throgs Neck, City Island, uh, Wakefield and East Chester, Classen Point, Riverdale. These are areas, these are your primary areas which have high percentages of home ownership. And that's what makes Having a property tax base of primary owners is what makes villages and towns successful. 
So, with that, questions, comments? Is that song? Thank you. Just no torches, please. <laughs> <laughs> What's on? You're saying they're getting rid of cars. Where, how are people Okay, hold on, hold on. Scott, you, I'm going to go with her and then you. Sorry, let me start with her. So, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. They're getting rid of cars. How are people supposed to get around? No cars. No parking. MPA. So, they're not getting rid of cars. They're just not forcing people to build parking. And that's going to be their statement. You're going to have the choice to have a car, and you're going to have a choice to live somewhere, but that place may not have parking on site because it's built or doesn't have to require, is not required to build that anymore. Okay? The answer is scooter, bicycle, <laughs> pedestrian. This is Speak Up. This is Sandra Shelby. Till next time, goodbye.